all over my face. I was prepared for everything. I gathered my last strength and began to preach as fast as I could. His persecutors were speechless. The foreign devil, while lying in the muck, still spoke of the wonders of his religion. This probably saved his life. Many of his confreres, who came from Steyl year after year, considered his love for the Chinese exaggerated. He no longer permitted them to speak ill of the Chinese. One confrere even wrote to the founder in Steyl that he should order Joseph van Adamitz back to Europe. The reason being that if he only saw good in the Chinese, he would not be able to convert them. Van Adamitz had an answer ready. The only language that all people understand is the language of love. It was not in line with the trends of his time that Europeans held Chinese in high regard. China, with its rich tradition and culture, had reached the low point of its history. Chixi, widow of the emperor, ruled in the forbidden city of Beijing with a corrupt court. The lost wars against Japan, France and England forced China into humiliating treaties. As a result, hatred for foreigners was understandable, and foreigners included missionaries. On November 1st, 1897, the missionaries, Richard Henle and Franz Nies, were murdered. In the absence of the bishop, Father Fernandez was the superior of the mission. His telegram to Arnold Janssen read, Nice Henle murdered. It influenced world politics. In the harbor of Kiai Chao, where today Chinese battleships are anchored, German battleships entered on the pretext that they had to protect the missionaries. For the German Empire, it was a welcome excuse to begin an already long-planned invasion. As a result, today's rich industrial Tsingtao began its development. Emperor William II arrogantly declared, Where the German eagle has sunk its claws into the land, that land is German and will always remain German. Father Fernandez celebrated high mass with the soldiers and let himself be photographed with them in spite of not being a German citizen. His health was no longer the best. In 1898, doctors discovered he had tuberculosis. He was throwing up blood. Bishop Anzer sent him to Japan for a cure, but he was bored. I vegetate for days in this land of the rising sun, caring for the health of my poor body. After a month, he was back in China. Something was brewing in China. In 1900, the xenophobic Boxer Rebellion broke out. The missionaries fled to the coast, except Father Fernandez and the brother. They smuggled themselves back to Puoli. Here, 1,000 Christians, persecuted for their acceptance of a foreign religion, had barricaded themselves in the mission station. Its ruins, even today, give the impression of a fort Fernandez prepared himself and the refugees for death. Did he want to become a martyr, offering his life for China? Arnold Janssen appointed Joseph Fernandez as provincial on June 1st, 1900. The provincial had the same duties towards his confreres as the bishop had towards his priests. The provincial provided personnel for the bishop. But the relationship between Bishop Anzer and Provincial Fernandez was bad. The two pioneers of the South Shantung Mission did not understand each other. Anzer was the great organizer and manager. For the bishop, Fernandez was too weak and compliant. When in Berlin, the bishop was guest of the emperor. In his residence in Yen Shofu, which still exists today, he preferred the visits of dignitaries and politicians to those of his collaborators. He liked to live in style to an unacceptable degree. With deep pain, 
the pro-vicar Fanatimus felt obliged to ask for the bishop's removal. In the meantime, the bishop died. Would Fanatimus be his successor? He wrote to a colleague. No one puts a mitre on a wooden head. Yet he protested that his name was excluded from the candidates through the intervention of Berlin only because he was an Austrian citizen. He would not have been bishop for long. His strength was spent. When he caught typhoid, he no longer had any resistance to it. He allowed himself to be brought to a small house in Taikia, in which he lived as provincial, and which today is a small shop. Here he passed his last days and hours. These commemorative plaques in Latin and Chinese have survived the passing years and remind us even today that he died here. With trembling hand, he wrote his last letter. Dear Father Reuse, I write from my bed sick with typhoid. I have to prepare for my last hour. Let the will of the Almighty God be done. The missionaries took their leave of him and promised to continue to work in his spirit. He replied, You want to continue to work in my spirit? I haven't always done things correctly. On Tuesday, January 28, 1908, around 6 p.m., he died. Fu Shen Fu had reached the age of 56. Father Johannes Duster wrote in his diary, A heavy blow. We immediately prayed for the deceased and also to him. Many Chinese came, prayed and wept. One of them said, I feel as if I have lost my own father and mother. Fernandemut's last wish was to be buried in the so-called Chinese cemetery, but this desire was not honored as he was buried in the cemetery for missionaries. During the Cultural Revolution, his grave was completely destroyed. In the 1980s, a memorial was built at a different place incorporating the remains of his gravestone. No one doubts that his life's wish was fulfilled. Even in heaven, I want to be Chinese. By writing Joseph's name into the Book of Saints, the Church honors his deep love for the Chinese. In Taikia, where he lived and died as provincial, the Church has been returned to the Catholics and carefully restored. There you will surely hear Saint Fu Yoshe Shen Fu pray for us. <laughs>